good evening, my dear sisters in the Hope of Israel. It's good to be with you, uh, with you once more. Um, if I'd have known uh, what I was going to do, well, you would know it. I would have done it completely different. Because really, this should take two addresses. There's that much in there. We could just spend looking at those verses we just read. Um, but I started the way I've done it, so you you'll look with it, unfortunately. Um, let us go, shall we, to Genesis chapter 30, please, first, um, where we read of Joseph. Um, and basically, it's accepted that he is the 11th son of Jacob uh, by Rachel. And we're going to start this address, really, brothers and sisters, and end with it, with this sentiment that we have in verse 22. Because this sets the scene, really, uh, for Joseph and his character. When I feel he takes after his mother. And we read, and God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. God remembered. And so this is a special occasion, isn't it? Where else do we read of God remembering? Well, Noah. God tells us that he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So we've got a link there, haven't we? Well, I want you to keep a finger in Genesis because we'll be spending most of our evening in the book of Genesis. And turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and you'll know where I'm going with this one. And verse 11. And she, Hannah, vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me. Similarly, in verse 19, and they rose up in the early morning and worshipped for the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Is it a coincidence that this word remembered is used of two uh, very strong individuals, individuals who were raised up by God to do uh, his will. But in verse 24, we read of uh, we read of his name. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. And that's what the name means. It means may he be added or is adding to and when you actually look through um, the sons uh, in this chapter, um, five of them, uh, the memorial name is used, Yahweh is used, and Joseph is the last one. The rest of the children are used by the name Elohim or God, and Benjamin is not mentioned either. And so... Straight away, we can see there's something special about this man, um, Joseph. But after his birth, the next mention is in a very, very difficult situation in chapter 33. And in verses 1 and 2, we see the instance of uh, the meeting up with, uh, with Esau when obviously they saw his 400 men. And they thought, well, what's going to happen here? But when you actually read uh, chapter 33, you begin to see um, there's a bit of a pecking order here because you put your most vulnerable in the front and your most precious at the back. And you see here all the concubines and their children are put in the firing line, if you like. And who's at the back? He's being protected. It's Joseph and his uh, mother. And so not many years later, we come to Genesis 37 and verse 2. Uh, it says, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. The land was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. 
And notice here, the generations. Generations are very important when you start to look at them in Scripture. Why is it important here? Although we have no genealogy, um, but it's still important. I think it is because Joseph alone is mentioned because now he is the centre of the narrative which fills the remainder of the book of Genesis. The whole of Israel to be is centred around this young man. And we read here that he's feeding or, or I might say supervising his brethren who were uh, in verse 2. And he was looking after his half-brothers. And we know who they were, don't we? They were Dan and Naphtali and Gad and Asher. And so we see, again, there is a pecking order, isn't there? He is above the sons of the concubines. He is the son of Rachel. And so these brothers are younger than he is. And, of course, that doesn't go down well, does it? Any of you who have been in the family who've got a brother or a sister and the rivalry, especially if there are only a couple of years between them, is quite ferocious, isn't it? Um, human nature, it's the same thing here. I mean, would I have liked a younger brother? I haven't got one. Telling me uh, what to do? No way. And so they obviously think he's uh, spilling the beans, you know, the evil report. My margin says probably inattention to duty for caring for the sheep or they were playing around or whatever. And so we can see straight away uh, things aren't going too well with with his um, um, his older brothers. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colours. Son of his old age. You can actually work it out. Um, Jacob was 91 when he had his son. And he died when he was 137. So he was quite uh, well um, ad advanced uh, in years. We won't go into the, uh, into the, the coat of many colours. Um, 37 verse 4, we see the problem again. His brethren saw their father loved him more than all his brethren. They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And of course, it's here, look at me, uh, a type of Christ. Look at me here. We'll, look, we'll, we'll be looking at types of Christ uh, um, at the end of, um, end of the talk. What a situation to cope with. Not very pleasant. 37 verse 5. Joseph dreamed a dream. It's a double emphasis there. Um, or as my margin says, a significant dream. And it certainly was, because we know what the outcome of this uh, dream was. And in verse 9, we are told about this dream, that the sun and the 11 stars made abeyance unto him, unto Joseph. Uh, Obviously, this didn't go down too well because the my margin says the eleven stars could be the eleven signs of the zodiac, and Joseph being the twelfth. And I think this would have really got under their uh, skin uh, when he was talking uh, about this. But notice he's in verse <coughs> ten and eleven, um, it's a bit confusing because his father. Rebukes him. Again, in verse 11, his father observed the saying. And again, we see another type of Christ, don't we? Mary um, took to heart the words that Jesus said, kept them in her heart. So we've got this kind of a Jekyll and Hyde, I think, here with Jacob. In one moment, he's, he's giving me, you know, he's telling him off. Then the next minute, he's thinking about it. And one thing that was brought to my attention, which I didn't realise uh, at the time, that although he says, shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down before ourselves to thee to this earth, uh, 
his mother wasn't alive. She was already dead. Verse 36 of 37. And all his sons. I can't remember. Oh, and the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt. And to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. And here we have a, a high ranking official of quite some importance. And the captain of the guard, my margin says he was in charge of the police. As well, he had military duties as well. So he was he was a pretty uh, important person um, in Egypt. And we can see how God is using this to bring about his will, isn't he? And when we know the story as we go on, you think, OK, oh, this is going well. But we know it doesn't go well, but it does in the end. And this is the way how God's will works, uh, isn't it? Often we think um, how it's going to work out. It never works out like it. It might get there eventually. Um, and it's the same here with, um, uh, with Joseph. In chapter 39, notice in verses 1, 2, and 5, this is now Joseph's new environment. Captain of the guard, an Egyptian. Verse 2, he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And notice verse 5, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. So there's emphasis there that he was in a foreign land. And um, this was the the environment now Joseph was going to find himself in. And being very young, that's quite uh, quite daunting, isn't it? To go out from a nice family background, although he'd probably be pleased to get away from his brothers. Um, it's still not a very nice thing to go into another culture, another country. But things are going well. He's industrious. He's overseeing the house. Potiphar is very happy. He realises, as we read in verse 5, he's benefiting. And then his wife puts a spanner in the works, doesn't she? And we know the rest. It's interesting reading in verse 14. That she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought an Hebrew unto us to mock us. And we get a flavour here of what the locals thought of the Hebrews. And I, I suggest to you this is probably the first anti-Semitism that we uh, probably find uh, uh, in the word. And of course, it's easy to blame somebody, isn't it? And so she plays this race card against, uh, against uh, Joseph. Verse 20, and the Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. He was there in the prison. So things aren't going too well. I don't know what would have been going through his mind. You know, well, I'm in prison now. It's not my fault. Um, in the Jewish commentary that I've got, it says the prison, the word here uh, seems to be an Egyptian one. Um, the Midrash explains that Potiphar had some doubt as for the truth of the accusation against Joseph, otherwise he would have put him to death instead of putting him in prison. And that's what rulers or people who were in authority did in these countries, didn't they? They didn't think anything of uh, taking someone's life, the, uh, the smallest um, uh, of matters. Verse 21 of 39, the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him mercy and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And so we can see that the Lord uh, is with him. Even when you think your luck's down and it's running out, you carry on showing a willingness to work. And with the Lord's help, he is elevated once more a second time 
although he was uh, in prison. And we see there what kind of character he was. He was a doer. Another example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as we go to the uh, close of our meeting, that is uh, one of the uh, types of Christ that I am naturally uh, spotted. Uh, but I think it's a good one there. A doer, the doer of God's word. And so in chapter 40, verse 5, we get this uh, emphasis again on dreamed a dream. You know, it's an important dream here, which is going to have consequences. And we know what the dream is all about in verse 11. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, etc., etc. Uh, is this a coincidence that this uh, verse is talking about the way of life in Egypt? A religious ceremony connected with the worship of Horus as portrayed in Egyptian paintings. Is it a coincidence that Moses does exactly the same with the plagues? pointing out uh, the, uh, the futility of the uh, gods that they they worshipped. And in chapter 41, he has another dream. Um, he, uh, that um, Joseph uh, is going to explain. And verse 2, he says, And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favoured kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. Coincidence again, the cow, the emblem of Isis in the Egyptian uh, Book of the Dead is represented as a bull accompanied by seven cows. It's no coincidence, is it? And of course, Joseph uses this to bring about the seven years uh, of famine and the seven years uh, of plenty. But Joseph is called before Pharaoh. In verse 14, and he says, And Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. When in Rome, brothers and sisters, you do as Rome does, don't you? He made himself presentable. If it's against your conscience, then you don't do it. But this was being respectful to um, to Pharaoh, and that's what he did. He looked his best. Etiquette, good manners, call it uh, what you uh, what you like. And so he shaved. The beard was a disgrace in Egypt. They didn't have beards, did they? But shaving is a disgrace in Palestine as well. So we can see here that Joseph is conducting himself in a proper manner, not bringing attention to himself, saying, look, I've got a beard. You know, I'm a Hebrew. He's prepared to sacrifice a beard and to have good manners. Notice 41 verse 16. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And we can see here, can't we? There's no elevation of his own thing, but it gives honour to God. What a type of Christ we have there. Don't, don't we? Not my will, Father, but your will be done. So Christ-like in his attitude. And we all know now the outcome that Joseph is elevated a third time, this time to the highest position that you could ever get other than being a pharaoh. He was now what they call the Grand Vizier. In chapter 41, verse 42, we see, and Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And we see the signet ring is thereby symbolically endowing Joseph with the royal authority and seal. The gold chain or collar apparently signifies 
his office as the Grand Vizier or the Prime Minister. And we see this in verse uh, 43. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him rule over all the land of Egypt. And we can see, we can't be there, references to a type of Christ, you know, bow the knee. We know that every knee shall bow, don't we, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 45. As we know, uh, in most um, countries where Israel have been or are going to be, people who serve in the royal courtyard uh, are given names. Like Daniel. And similarly, Pharaoh gives Joseph a name. Zephanath Paneah, that he gave him to wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land uh, of Egypt. That word, Zephanath Paneah, means abundance of life or food. For the living, as one comes here, says the food man of the life. And we can only think of the Lord Jesus Christ probably as being the bread uh, of life. Just one question, Ben Sisters. Um, verse 45, I'm a bit, I've got a bit of a, a puzzle with it. Um, he marries into a priest family. I don't know what this priest believed. Was he a priest of the Egyptians, which I would have thought he would have been? Uh, why marry somebody who is not a Hebrew? Maybe there's no other choice. We know elsewhere in scripture, like Esther, marries the king. He was a Gentile. Maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. In verse 46, we see now that he's 30 years of age and he stood before Pharaoh and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and he went throughout all the land of Egypt that's mentioned twice verse 45 and in verse 46 this was a big job wasn't it being the prime minister as it were he's got a lot uh, on his plate and just think he'd probably been in prison for 11 or 12 years uh, by the time um, we're reading here. So eventually it took that amount of time for him to get where God wanted him to be. And we do know, uh, uh, and we know we're doing that. You can't hurry uh, God's will uh, or his plan. I'm just going to read you a little section of a, um, a book I've had. Some of you may have read this book. It's called A Test of Time by David Roll. Um, it doesn't believe in the word, but he uses it as a uh, document to um, support his archaeology um, of Egypt. And it's quite interesting that um, he's actually, he reckons he's found uh, Joseph's palace. And uh, he says, Joseph's brethren were shepherds who brought their flocks with them, Genesis 47, Analysis of the skeletal remains of the livestock found in the compound area shows the Asiatic settlers introduced a long-haired sheep into the delta of the Nile uh, at this time. Uh, this passage indicates in uh, Genesis 50 that Joseph had an estate in Goshen and in all likelihood built a model palace or residence which formed the focal point of the, the Israelite settlement. When Joseph was actively pursuing his duties, he was undoubtedly either touring the country, as we've just read, or in residence uh, in the capital. So he was quite busy. And also it looks like he set his base, if you like, uh, very close to um, his, uh, his family. In chapter 45... Um, verse 9 
to 11. Jumping ahead of it now. And we see here, he says, Haste ye, go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt, come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, thou shalt be near unto me, there are thy children, and thy children's children, and my flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household, and all that hast come to poverty. Why Goshen? It was the best pasture land in the whole of Egypt. We can read that in Genesis 40, uh, 47. But notice in verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve you, a posterity in the earth, and save your lives by a great deliverance. We can begin to see here that Joseph knew what he had to do. He was at God's bidding. He was doing God's will. Now, the word is very much pretty silent on Joseph's day job. Um, but, brothers and sisters, uh, in this book, he, he actually states that, um, that Joseph put a lot of infrastructure into the um, into Egyptian uh, countryside. Uh, he radicalised it. He got rid of all the uh, the corruptness, and obviously he, he did this with uh, you know with God's blessing and uh, and with God's uh, power. And he set up three centres. One up, we call higher Egypt, one in the middle of Egypt, one in the lower of, of Egypt. And he was travelling up and down, I dare say the Nile, and he had three different headquarters. Um, we don't read of this in scripture because the, script, uh, the word is not interested in that. It's more interested in what was going to happen to uh, Israel uh, as a nation. But we see part of this in Genesis 47. We begin to see the power that Joseph had. Verse 19, we see not is all well in the camp. And we can see here the famine. It's biting. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we in our land? Buy us in our land for bread. And we own our land, and we will serve unto Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not <coughs> desolate. In, my, in one of my commentaries, it, um, it's got uh, on this uh, particular one. Both we and our land. And this is where Joseph changed things completely. Because the old feudal nobility of Egypt disappeared. These were the people who were the corrupt ones. They were taking the money before he got to Pharaoh. And so he roots, uh, he roots them out. And at the same time, the granaries make their appearance. And the superintendent of which became one of the most important of the Egyptian officials, which was, of course, uh, Joseph. And in verse 21, and as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other <coughs> thereof. So a lot of people were moved. And so we can begin to see how he's, he's, he, he's bringing about this, uh, this new policy. And so the cities become depots. They become granaries. Verse 22. Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion, which Pharaoh gave them, whereof they sold not their lands. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day, and your hand for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow of the land. 
And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own, the seed of the field and for your food and for them of your household, and for food for your little ones. It's quite sweeping reform here. And what we've basically got in verses 23 and 24 is uh, VAT, isn't it? You know, your 20%. Uh, which was a tax, and they had to take it in order for them uh, to uh, survive. Um, the Jews in the time of the Maccabees paid the Syrian government a tax, and that was one third in the Maccabees' time. So 20% is a lot better than uh, having a third uh, that were taken off you. So it wasn't uh, that extraneous for them to take this or absorb this 20% VAT charge. Then we see in verse 25, and they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And how fitting that is as a, as a type of Christ, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part except the land of the priests only, which came not Pharaoh's. So I dare say he put all this uh, into uh, uh, operation. But let's go back uh, to the narrative, because we jumped a bit there. Go back to uh, 42, verse 7 uh, and 8. We know a lot of this stuff, don't we, from uh, Sunnah School days. Uh, 42. Verse 7, and we see here Joseph, he's meeting his brothers, and he starts to do a bit of play acting, and he gives them the run around, doesn't he, for a bit. Verse 7, Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them. Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew uh, him not. He must have changed a lot. Um, I can pretty much recognised people from years. Uh, obviously, he talked like an Egyptian, walked like an Egyptian. Everything about him was Egyptian, so they didn't recognise him. Um, and I think it was the same with Moses. But a bit of trick, isn't it, in verse 23? Uh, and they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. You know, that's a little bit sneaky, isn't it? Um, I've been in meetings where somebody uh, who could speak German and the company that we were working for were German, but they didn't know. And he said, you don't want to hear what they or what they think of you. He says, it's not very nice. Um, very crafty, isn't it? But this is how God works, isn't it? He uses people's characters to... Uh, to bring about uh, his will. And we saw in verse 24, he gets very, very emotional. We see the same in chapter 43 and verse uh, 30. Joseph made haste for his bowels, did yearn upon his brother, then he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber, and he wept. He wept there. And in chapter 43, verse 31, he washed his face, went out and refrained himself and said, set on bread. And they set on for him by himself, and for them did by themselves eat, for the Egyptians which did eat with them by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the uh, Egyptians. So we can see here, you know, there's this racial divide isn't there they didn't like the hebrews it was an abomination to sit with them or even eat uh, with them and we see here that uh verse 33 and they sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright the youngest according to his youth and the men marveled at one a another uh my margin says here that uh, this was to try them and to see whether they were still moved with envy. Um, but also we see here, uh, possibly it's suggested that 
Joseph seated them uh, in age, and that's what they were probably marvelling at. Maybe he was trying to give them their idea, you know, I'm Joseph, you know, has the penny dropped yet? But obviously, um, you know, it hadn't. Um, chapter 44 is about the cup in the sack, isn't it? Or the cups in the sack. Uh, Joseph can't carry on his facade anymore. Um, so we see, don't we, in chapter 45, and the first five verses, it basically almost breaks down. And we see a lot of weeping, don't we, in verse 2, and he wept aloud. Jesus uh, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. <laughs> you often wonder what they were thinking. Um, what's he crying for? You know, number two, and he's crying his he's crying his eyeballs out. What's the matter with him? But this is human nature, isn't it? This is his character, weeping. And sweeping carries on, doesn't it, in verse 14 and, and 15. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck. Then he wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. After that, his brethren talked with him. No problem for Pharaoh, as we see in verses 17 to 20. And here we see uh, uh, Israel are given express invitation from Pharaoh come on down 45 verse 21 and the children of Israel did so and Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh notice there the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way Joseph didn't say I'll give you this I'll give you that I'll give you the other it was according to the commandment even Joseph, although he was, he was number two, he knew his place uh, in the hierarchy here. Again, we see here the humility, can't we? He could have got carried away with, with his um, status in life. Again, here we see, don't we, his humility, and of course, pointing forward uh, to Christ himself. But Joseph didn't get it all right, did he? We don't get it all right. Do we? And we see this only in chapter 48. We see Jacob blesses Joseph's sons, but not to his liking. Uh, chapter 48, verse 18. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. His father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall be a people. He also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh, and set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. So we can see here the promise. And Joseph knew that they were going to have to go to Israel one day. And just think of all the work that he was doing. All this work of this land reform and agricultural reform and construction products uh, for the Egyptians. Uh, and it would serve them for many years to come. But in the end, he knew that Israel would, as a nation, would not be staying in Egypt because he had that faith, didn't he? Moreover, verse 22, I have given thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now, if you've got a margin, you might have in, in your margin, verse 22, the word... Portion is the Hebrew word Shechem. And both Abraham and Jacob bought property at Shechem. And Jacob recovered it out of the hand of the Amorite 
we must have seized it, although we don't read about it. And so we get this double portion as well. And so, well, Shechem, where is Shechem? Well, Shechem is in the hill country of Ephraim. Is that a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that Joseph's bones were buried there also? Exodus tells us that. Is it a coincidence that later on when the kingdoms divide, the northern kingdom's capital is in Ephraim's territory? And prophets like Jeremiah and Hosea sometimes refer to the entire nation as Ephraim. So Joseph gets the double portion. Reuben forfeited the birthright. And how apt that it would be Jacob who gave the greater blessing to the younger and not the elder. There's no school duggery here, is there? As he was with Esau. And this bunch of sisters, when you look at it, actually, we see it elsewhere in the scripture that the younger brother is preferred to the elder. But Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, David, Solomon. So it's, it's nothing new, is it, brothers and sisters? Genesis 49. Lovely chapter, isn't it? Uh, there's more words, more verses on Joseph than anybody else in this chapter. Verse 26. The blessing of thy father hath prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Just look at those last few words there, but you see again here a type of Christ. Separate, set apart, the consecrated one. So you can see how special Joseph was uh, indeed, can't we? In the plan of the purpose of God and in the setting up of Israel, basically, uh, uh, as a nation. But Joseph's faith was that Israel would be back in the land. There's no two ways about that. He knew that. His father told it him earlier on in, in Genesis 48. And we see it again in chapter 50. Verse 24, Joseph said unto his brethren, I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swear to her, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, whose covenant he remembered. Verse 26, uh, uh, 25 and Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in, in Egypt. The commentary I've got uh, actually comments that his faith in the divine promise to redeem his people. Joseph's bones are to participate in the return to Canaan and they were to rest there. Exodus 8, verse 19, and Joshua 24, 32. The word coffin is an interesting one. It's the same Hebrew word that is used to the receptacle of the tables of the law. This is significant because Judaism preaches respect for human personality as a duty. The rabbis say the nations wondered why the children of Israel in their wanderings through the desert carried them with the bones of Joseph in a similar ark and in the same reverential manner as they did the tables of covenant. So we can see here the more significance of why uh, Joseph went uh, as well. I'm just going to try and get onto my PowerPoint. Um, I've got a list of um, types of Christ. Now, this has been cribbed. I can't put my hand up to all of these. Um, it's a list I had, I've had for a long, long time, over 100. 
Um, when I started to look at them, some of them were a bit far fetched, a bit uh, stretching the point. Um, I've revamped it. You might feel some of them are a little stretched. And um, there's some that I've mentioned tonight which aren't on there. Um, I've got it in Excel format. I can hand them out to Daz after, um, if you like uh, a copy of them. Uh, I, I'm not very good on computers. Um, I tried, well, copy and paste into Excel. Didn't do what I thought it would do. But it's the best that... Uh, you can see there are obvious ones there that uh, we know. Feeding the Flock, Evil Report, Love Boy's Father, Hated, Not Believed, Bayance, Envied, His Father Observed, They're Saying, Sent to His Brethren. Um, he came to Shechem. That's, uh, Jesus went in there also to, uh, to Sychar. I'll seek my brethren to come to see. They conspired against him. He was stripped. He got the pit. The horrible pit. We have, of course, the idea of death uh, and resurrection. 20 pieces of silver um, into Egypt. Out of Egypt have I uh, called my son. He was a servant. Spotify, form of a servant. The Lord was with him. The Lord made all that he, he, he did do. Prosper in his hand. Everything was put into his hand. Uh, blessed for Joseph's sake. We can be blessed in Christ, aren't we? Well favoured. He was favoured with God and man. Um, think on me. I think he's a very nice one, isn't it? Uh, in remembrance. Of me, uh, it is not in me. The son can do nothing of himself, but of the father. God showed Pharaoh what he sees the father do. In whom the spirit of God, of course, with Christ, who is anointed with the Holy Spirit, uh, over my house, soon over his own house, all my people be ruled. The government will be upon his shoulder. Bow the knee, every knee shall bow. And we got this 30 years old when they started to do the, uh, to do the work. Gathered all corn without number, unsearchable riches of Christ. Ephraim means fruitful, much fruit in John. Um, going to Joseph, Lord, to whom shall we go? He opened the storehouses, he opened up the scriptures for us. He knew them, he knew all men. But they knew him not, the world knew him not. His blood is required. We know his blood be on us, they said. Joseph understood them. We know Christ was of quick understanding. Turned himself and wept. We know Jesus wept. Seven times it's mentioned that Joseph wept in Genesis. Not just there, but just we had a man who was full of sorrows, wasn't he? Fill their sack with corn, his fullness. We have received, haven't we? We store every man's money without money and without price. Provision for the way, all your need. As much as they can carry, as much as they would. Bring these men home, compel them to come in. Make ready. All things are ready. Made himself know, eyes opened and knew him. Your brother whom ye sold, whom thou persecutest, come near to me, made nigh. God did send him, God sent his only begotten son, a great deliverance who delivered us from so great a death. Not you, but God, the permanent counsel and foreknowledge of God. There will I nourish thee. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Nourished all his father's household, as little child is nourished. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not what? Behold your eyes, behold my hands, my feet. Come unto me. Regard not your stuff, forget those things. Joseph is yet alive, Paul said of one Jesus whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Jacob, let me die since I have seen thy face. Simeon, prior to his death, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. My brethren, he's not ashamed to call them. I have bought you. We've been bought with a great price. 
save much people alive many sons unto glory fear ye not let your not heart be troubled a fruitful bough whose branches run i am the vine the other branches fruitful bear by a well in him a well of water sorely grieved acquainted with grief from thence is the shepherd christ is the good shepherd of the sheep isn't he the stone of israel the stone that was rejected became the chief cornerstone and finally let the blessing come upon the head of joseph anoint thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows separate from his brethren separate from sinners the birthright was joseph's christ the firstborn among many brethren a new king which uh, a new king which knew not joseph which none of the princes of this world knew the house of joseph shall abide in their coasts abide in me and i in you the lord hath blessed me blessed with all spiritual blessings the hand of joseph prevailed more than the conquerors through him that loved us. It's just over 80 there. Um, so I've got a few more to put on. <laughs> but um, I want to finish with just three passages. Hebrews 11, verse 22. You can't go not mention Joseph, but go to Hebrews. And here we have another type, which is book. Thought I got it all right. Um, this is amazing thing about the word of God, isn't it, my sisters? You can actually find more and more if you just dig a little bit deeper. Hebrews 11, verse 22. By faith, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. And the word departing is exodus. Now, that word is only used three times in the New Testament. We'll go to Luke 9, and we'll finish in 2 Peter. Luke 9, verse 31. The Transfiguration. Who appeared in glory and spake of his exodus, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. I want to finish, brothers and sisters, with the words of 2 Peter 1, where this word Exodus is used, and it brings us back to the very beginning with Rachel. 2 Peter 1, verse 12. And notice the word here, brothers and sisters, Paul uses a lot in this chapter, Remembrance, remember. Wherefore, I will not be diligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. And that's us, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Or should be. Yea, I think it meet, so long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And this is what Joseph did, didn't he? He was remembering promises that were given to him. He was remembering the responsibility that he had to do God's will. Knowing this, that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavour that ye may be able after my exodus to have these things always in remembrance. Thank you.